ein. Verse 24. We're studying this discussion of Christian liberty. We've looked at chapter 8, chapter 9, verses 1 to 23, and now we look at the next aspect of this that Paul is dealing with. Remember, through this we've told you that when, you're, when the Son sets you free, you're free indeed, but we're not to use our freedom as an excuse to feed our flesh, rather we're to use it to show love. In chapter 8, verses 1 to 13, love toward our weaker brethren. Chapter 9, verses 1 to 23, love to see the gospel advance unimpeded, so we will practice self-denial. We've got the picture on the bulletin, I would remind you. Linda's keeping it there for us, that Christian liberty is a great field, and yet it's bounded by a fence called self-denial. And that's how we understand this. I want to commend to you again the pamphlet by Tom Askell, my brother, on the biblical doctrine of accommodation. It'll help you wrestle through some implications and issues with this. It's available for me to send to you. All you have to do is ask. Someone asked this week, and we sent it on to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through chapter 10, verse 22. We will not get through this today. We're going to tackle the last part of chapter 9. And then next Sunday and the Sunday following, unpack 1 Corinthians 10. But we want to read this because it's part of a whole section. Stand with me if you would. Find it in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen so that you can see. We're, 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 we're dogmatic here about you hearing the Scriptures, seeing the Scriptures. We read together every Sunday so that you can say the Scriptures. Because what matters, what matters finally is what saith the Scriptures, the truth is what sets you free. Follow along as I read these verses. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest having, after preaching to others, I find myself to be disqualified. Chapter 10, verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Excuse me. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Mark that, mark that verse, verse 12. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from it, idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. 
You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? This is what? It's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Like I said, we're not going to unpack all this today. We're going to look at the first portion of it. But there's a lot here that we need to hear and learn from. So I hope you're going to plan to hang with us over the next few Sundays to work through that. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, as I said to you, in this discussion of Christian liberty, which we've been looking at now for several weeks, the first portion that Paul tackled was the concern that we should have for the well-being of weaker brothers, people who have scruples. Chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. We should be willing to abstain from any activity that offends uh, weaker brothers. And you've got to be careful. We talked when we went through this. We're not going to rehearse this, but you've got to be careful that no one in the name of being a weaker brother binds the conscience of other people. But the principle is that we need to be sensible and sensitive and love one another. Be driven by love, not liberty. And if we do, then we'll find a great balance here. The other line of reasoning was this concern for the unimpeded progress of the gospel. We looked at that last couple of Sundays, chapter 9, verses 1 to 23, where Paul said, there's a lot of things that I can do and I can claim, but there are things I lay down for the gospel. I don't want my life to be an impediment to the gospel. What we're looking at now in chapter 9, verse 24 through chapter 10, verse 22 is a warning to the strong that it's perilous to your own soul if you give in to self-indulgence and complacency. If in the name of being a Christian you, you indulge yourself and you, you become complacent, your, your soul is in peril. I'm going to show you how much Paul thought that was. The text we read in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands, and the picture there is who stands erect, who stands straight and tall, take heed lest he fall. Pride goes before the strength. A haughty spirit goes before the fall. Paul is warning them there. I'm going to challenge you. Everyone sitting in here this next coming Saturday night is going to be tempted with complacency. You're going to lose an hour of sleep. Where are you going to find it? You're going to find it on the other end? On Sunday morning dawns and, and instead of being 7 o'clock, it's 8 o'clock. Or instead of being 8 o'clock, it's, it's actually 9 o'clock. Instead of being 9, it's 10. You're going, to be, you're going to be tempted. I promise you that. How are you going to respond? You're going to respond with complacency, which Paul is, is, is warning earnestly against here. Are you going to say, okay, to the glory of God, be true to my Savior, true to the covenant of the people that I've covenanted with? I'm going to recognize this. I'm going to set my clocks an hour forward. I'm going to, if I need to do, go to bed an hour earlier so that I can rise and fight complacency. Because I promise you, you have an enemy of your soul. He would love nothing better than for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to sleep in next Sunday. In fact, I'm not so sure that this whole daylight savings thing is not a scheme of the devil, but I can't prove that, all right? But I know it's an assault upon the church every time spring comes along to get the people of God to sleep in. He hates it when you're here. He hates it when you're here. He delights when you find something better to do. We'll fight against that. Paul's teaching on this. You want to learn how to deal with that? Hang in here with Paul. He will show you because he's, he speaks on three levels uh, the first is all we're going to look at today. The first is his own experience, reminding the Corinthians how he treated himself so that he would not be, and the, the word here is fascinating, disqualified. It's the word adakimos in verse 27. We're going to get to it in a minute. Adakimos. It is the same word that is used in other portions of Scripture as reprobated. Finally, cast into hell. Some commentators try to tone this down. Uh, I'm not convinced that Paul's toning it down when he uses it here. We'll see why. So the second two things he thinks about is this experience of Israel, chapters 10 verses, chapter 10 verses 1 to 13, and then he appeals to the Corinthians in their own daily experience in chapter 10 verses 14 to 22. But today, for our purposes in the next few minutes, 
this experience of Paul, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. He says, do you not know? He's appealing to something they would be very familiar with. He uses this imagery here, the imagery of the games. The Olympic games were going on, but there was another, there was the Isthmian games, I-S-T-H. M I A N. The Isthmian Games actually took place in Corinth every two years. Five categories. They had leaping, which you and I would think of in terms of long jump or, or high jump, discus throwing, running, boxing, and wrestling. Those were the five categories of competition in the Isthmian Games. And if you watched the Winter Olympics recently, uh, I know you were fascinated like I was that there wasn't any track and field for that that would correspond. But the, the speed skating, the uh, ice skating, the uh, snowboarding, the, the cross-country skiing, just the, the endurance, the straining. It was just so impressive to see these athletes who trained and trained and trained and trained for the games. And it was also heartbreaking to see those you know had trained and trained and then would fall in their opportunity. And it cost them everything. So Paul has the games in mind. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Uh, there was no gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal in, in these Isthmian games. They received a wreath. It was very beautiful to receive. If you were the champion, if you were the victor, you would put, have the victor's crown put on you. But it would fade. Um, it would wither and die at some point. So run that you may obtain it. Now he's, he's taking an imagery from the games that you and I know that if we, if we run the race marked out for us, as Hebrews tells us, Lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles you and run with endurance the race that's been marked out for you, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising and shame. We know that all of us who run and who persevere to the end, Jesus said in Matthew, he who perseveres to the end shall be saved. That, that there's not a win or lose arrangement here. I'm not competing against you. I'm not, I'm not trying to beat you to the finish line because I know that if I beat you, then I win and you lose. Or, or I'm concerned that if you beat me to the finish line, then you win and I lose. That's, that's not the Christian life. But Paul is pressing upon them here a warning against complacency. The fact that all who endure to the end shall be saved should not promote complacency. Presumption. In fact, he's going to deal with that in the, in the wilderness wandering. And that's exactly what the children of Israel did. They became presumptuous. And we're getting this manna every day. Ah, it gets kind of boring. And then, the, then the quail comes down. That's nice. And there's always water. Ah, presume, presume, presume. God. Paul says, do not presume upon God. Do not presume upon the grace of God. You run. And don't think well of yourself because you think you may be running better than others. You run to receive the prize. Then he says in verse 25, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. And that's what you saw in the Olympic Games, by the way. The training, hours and hours, day after day after day. You've got to be impressed with that. I mean, no, I don't think anybody in his right mind was sitting watching all that going, I could probably do that. I think, give me a set of skates, I could probably do a triple sow cow. No. No, no anybody thinking that. Because you know these people have honed the skill. They have, they have sacrificed. They've made their lives about winning at the Olympic Games. The thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, as I used to say on ABC Sports. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Notice, they do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we and imperishable. He says, are you, are you willing to, to these Corinthians, the games you know about, you go to them, you admire them, you, are you willing to let them pour out themselves with more earnestness, more intensity, more vigor, more commitment than you who are running, who are racing to heaven to receive the crown of righteousness which the Lord himself will give on that day? 
Clearly you see what it is. Avoid complacency. Do not give in to it. It's tragic to see people who would claim that they've been Christians for, for years, perhaps decades, take up the attitude that is condemned in Scripture. I'm going to sit back, take my ease in Zion. No. No. The ease we get is when we hear at the end, after we've passed on, well done, good and faithful servant. Now come and enter into the joy of the rest that I prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's what we should, brothers and sisters, I don't, I, I want to wear out. I don't want to rust out as a child of God. And Paul's challenging the Corinthians not to give in to that temptation. So he says, so I do not run aimlessly. Now he brings it to himself. I'm aware that I'm racing. And I'm not yet letting the idea that, well, I've written half the New Testament. I mean, I've traveled most of the known world. I'm so far ahead of these people. No, no. Uh -uh. We read in Philippians. I don't pretend I've made it my own. I press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to lay hold of him who laid hold of me. That's the attitude Paul is commending. But he commends it from his own example, not just in teaching it, not just in precept, but in his own example. I do not run aimlessly. I run looking to Jesus. I run wanting to be more conformed to the image of Christ. I run wanting to put to death the deeds of the body. I run wanting to cultivate larger faith in Christ. I run wanting to take everyone I possibly can with me to heaven. Paul had that magnificent obsession. Oh, brothers, we need that. Who do you have on your list that you pray for? That you say, Father, give me this person's soul or I die. Who are you laboring with, praying for, walking beside, to see them come to faith in Christ that you might, they might join you on the way to heaven? I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one being in the air. Now he pulls in the boxing analogy, the idea of shadow boxing. He says, this isn't a game to me. Paul says, I train as one who would be thrown into the boxing arena, which, by the way, in his spiritual journey, he was often. He was found in situations where he had to box spiritually to defend himself, to defend the faith, to uphold the gospel, to fend off those uh, particularly the enemy of his soul who wanted to destroy him. Think what would have happened if the devil could have successfully taken Paul down. What would have happened to the New Testament? No, he was, he's dead in earnest about this. But I discipline my body. Keep it in check. Self-denial, right? Sacrifice, right? And keep it under control. The picture here of discipline, by the way, is, is, I, is I bruise myself. He's not, he's not a self-flagellation guy like some of these, some of these uh, Muslims are and some of these folks you see around the world. No, he's using imagery here. I, I discipline my body and keep it under control. Self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And here's why. Lest, after preaching to others, I should find myself disqualified. Adakimos. I'm coming to say, well, he, he, he doesn't want to lose his reward. Read Romans 9 and tell me, first part of chapter 9, first part of chapter 10, and tell me that's how Paul thinks. Paul says when he's speaking of his Jewish brethren, I, I speak the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience is, is verifying this. I could wish myself condemned, cast into hell, if that would mean the salvation of my Jewish peers. Here I think he's saying, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be cast away. Get to the end to be one of those who says in Matthew 7, in your name, Lord, we preached. In your name, Lord, we did mighty things. In your name, Lord, we cast out demons. And Jesus says, and I will make a profession, the final profession, the only profession, no matter your profession of faith and my profession of faith is Jesus' profession about us is the final one that matters. I will homo legeo, I will say, depart from me, you who lived as if 
There was no law. I never knew you. Paul is saying here, I do not want to come to the end of my life having preached across the known world about how Jesus is the only way. And it's a faithful saying and worthy of being accepted by all that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the chief. Having told people over and over that I was on the Damascus road, this light broke through. I was knocked from my, from my horse. The Lord spoke to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus. He said, I don't want to come to the end of my days having had all of that and find out that I was a hypocrite. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, if the Apostle Paul could be concerned about that, we cannot afford to be complacent. We cannot be. We cannot be. We've got to take a warning here and say, dear God, Search me, try me, know my thoughts. Lord, if, I, if I've started coasting, dear God, give me, a, give me a sanctified kick in the pants and stir me up, provoke me to love and good works, renew my zeal. If, if I can look on my Christian life and say there was a day when I had more zeal to engage in the gospel, then help me to repent, Lord, and to recover that. Time and age does not cause that to diminish. Oh, certainly there are some physical things we may not be able to do anymore that you could do at one point. I admire people, I'm not going to call names, but there's a couple of names that come to my mind who, who are facing challenges, physical challenges, and yet fight through them and play through them for the glory of God. I love that. That's what, that's what sanctification looks like. It's not, well, I'll, I'll serve Jesus where it fits into my schedule. Because I promise you, that Jesus isn't the one who died on the cross. Well, the one who died on the cross says, you know, we mind? Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. Not, not tell me how you used to take up. No, take up your cross daily. And then follow me. Here's the word. The word follow there is follow me to the end. It's not, it's not follow me as long as it's convenient or follow me for a season. And then you can tell people how you followed me. All. No, follow me to the end. That's the word. If we're not ready to follow Jesus Christ to the end, then we have not embraced him on his terms. His terms. I want to ask you as we close today. Is that the fellowship commitments you have to him? Follow him to the end. Take up a cross daily. Your desires say this. His word and his will and his way say this. And you say, excuse me a minute. I got to put this thing on the cross. <laughs> I got to nail it to the cross. Deny myself. Are we practicing that? Because Paul, Paul is dead serious about this. We have an opportunity. I want to challenge you as we leave. Leave this place. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, leave this place to say, Lord, the world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. Forgive me for letting the world get in between you and me and, and convince me that I can rewrite the terms of serving you. We can't. We can't. Many will say to me in that day, Matthew, I, I wish you said a few. I wish you said a few mistakes. No, many will say to me in that day, dear God, I don't want to be one of the many. I don't want anyone in this place to be one of the many. And yet we have to face the scripture's fact that many will say that. You're going to slay complacency. You're going to put to death 21st century Western idolatry. You're going to follow Christ. His call. We don't get to make up the terms. And I want to pray for you. I want, to, I want to see us flame out. I want to see us one by one come to the end of the journey and say, look how that person lived in Christ and died in Christ. Oh God, help me to have such zeal. That's what Paul's calling us to here, as he calls the Corinthians. He says, don't play games. The Isthmian games, don't allow people in them who play games. The Isthmian games are for people who are committed to achieving and excelling. The Christian life does not allow people who want to play games. Jesus is dead serious. He says, I died for you. I was stripped naked for you. I was beaten beyond recognition for you. And I was nailed to a cross for you. 
and God poured out his wrath on me for you. Do not play games with me. Or I will say at the end, I never knew you. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we forgive us. Forgive us for treating uh, with uh, so, so lightly. Even things like the Lord's Supper. Have a hit or miss attitude about it. Forgive us for thinking that we can follow Jesus on our terms. Forgive us for thinking he gets giddy just for anyone to pay a little attention to him. Oh, help us to hear the crucified, risen, ascended, ruling, reigning Jesus Christ thundering to our hearts and minds through the Apostle Paul that we must not let complacency mark our Christian walk, but that we must buffet our bodies. We must subdue our indulgences. We must make ourselves slaves, Olympian athletes for Jesus to live the Christian life well, to finish well. I pray that you would come, encourage, strengthen, Convict, exhort, rebuke, whatever has to happen in my mind, in the minds of these people here. Oh God, work in us and renew us to, to a zeal that reflects not that we're wearying out, a zeal that reflects that we have followed Christ for years and discovered he is more worthy of being followed today than he was the first day we encountered him as Lord and Savior. Help us to have done with lesser things, we pray. Jesus' sake. Amen. Stand